don't know why I said that. Welcome, fellow storm riders. You are officially a rider on the hypnotic storm. Welcome to session number 54 of Brain Software with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. He's got a new Egyptian cat. He's presenting at HypnoThoughts Live in Las Vegas this coming August, and he despises people who are educated beyond their intelligence. Please welcome to the center of the virtual hypnotic octagon, Mike Mandel. Yes, Chris. Good to be back as always, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and rich people out there. I don't know why I said that. Just looking for another thing to say. And Hilarious. poor people as well who can afford computers and podcasts. Anyway, we are back. I you said enrich. Enrich. <laughs> enriched. People who, are, who will be enriched by our discussions. Well, we are back is the bottom line. Yes. And yes, I do have a new Egyptian cat. He's an Egyptian Mao, and there some people consider them to be the oldest species of cat. So he's just he was twelve weeks old when I got him. So he's about fourteen weeks old now, and he is the best friend of my Bengal cat. So the two of them are friends together, and being an ilurophile, it works very well over here. Also, and, let's talk about hypno thoughts, though, Chris. Yeah, Las Vegas. Do you want to explain what this is? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something kind of cool. So we have taken note that over the last couple of years. Scott Sandlin, who is the founder of HypnoThoughts.com, which is, a, I would say, the biggest hypnosis discussion forum Absolutely. in the world. And it's a, it's a good site. And he's been putting together a conference that's been growing in leaps and bounds. And it's very reasonably priced, i.e. like 300 bucks or something for three days. And you get all of the training that's included in there with the price and a few meals and et cetera. And it's done at in August, I should say in August in Vegas where, you know, flights to Vegas are cheap and hotel rooms in August, of course, are incredibly cheap. And maybe we so should it's, explain why they are, Chris. Do you well, know why because it's so hot. cheap. Because it's so hot. Degrees. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really hot. It's not the ideal tourist time of year to go there. So it's a great time for people who are on a budget to save some money and go to a conference. Anyway, all that to say, Mike and I have taken notice of the growing popularity of that conference. We support the idea of giving away great quality information. So we put in your name, Mike, as a speaker, and you've been asked to present for two, uh, two one-hour sessions. And we're going to do that, and we're going to have a lot of fun, and we're going to give away some stuff to people who show up to the to the. Yes, we will. Well. And let's say, you know, Scott Sandlin does a great job with this. He's drawing in people from all over the world. HypnoThoughts Live is growing by leaps and bounds, and we applaud his um, forward thinking in bringing together from a people from a lot of different hypnotic backgrounds, a lot of different theories and schools, and you will literally be able to see a couple of dozen speakers. Well, you can't be everywhere at once. I'm sure some of the events are happening concurrently, and you will be paying your own hotel and so on. But check out the website, uh, HypnoThoughts Live 2015, and like I said, that isn't until or as Chris said, it's not until August, August, but we think it's going to be a phenomenal event. And we are hoping a lot of our hypnotic storm riders show up with a huge show of force and just have an absolute blast. Absolutely. It's going to be a great time. So that's what's going on in our world. The The other thing I guess to quickly mention is <laughs> I want to apologize in advance here because oh, that doesn't even make sense. Apologize in advance, does it? Our May hypnosis training for 2015, the live class, is it's not quite sold out right now, but I am still going through the waiting list and there are still several people on that waiting list. And I think I have something like four spots right now. So in other words, we're not going to be able to make a public announcement and say, Hey, the doors are open. You can go and register for our May 2015 architecture of hypnosis class. Unfortunately, every, every single spot will be gone by the time I get through the waiting list. So if you're interested, you're best to just send me an email and get on the next waiting list. It seems like unless we grow our class size a little bit, we're going to disappoint more people than I care to disappoint. Right. But thankfully, we've got the online training. We've got the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy up and running. It's fantastic. People are loving it. So join. You will love it. We are starting to do monthly. Well, I don't know if we'll keep doing them every month, but we've been doing webinars talking about some of this stuff and then but doing... But Chris, I mean, did we ever dream that the um, the live training would sell out seven, eight months in advance? It's just crazy. No, and I think a lot of it has to do with the podcast because we're doing this, what I consider to be world-class 
awesome content, free training. It's totally free, the podcast. And a lot of people are, of course, listening to it and then reporting back to us that, you know, this is how they found us and they've come to the class. So right. And we quite, love hearing from cool. you, you people out there. Uh, the number of emails we get from people who just listen to the podcast, you're not even in the online academy, nothing, but you say you've gotten some life-changing information from it, and nothing makes us happier than when people take this stuff and actually apply it. Right. We love that. So all, all of that, um, let's not spend too much time. Well, let's you know, not spend any classes. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so we did, we, did, uh, we did say we wanted to comment to everyone listening. Send us an email if you want to get on any of the waiting lists, or I should start calling them notification lists for classes, because we're already getting people who want to take the graphology training and the mindscaping training, wondering when the next ones are. Usually do we, we do mindscaping once a year in June, graphology once a year in September. We may push up the dates if we get enough people emailing us, but get on the, on the website, MikeMandelHypnosis.com. You'll see the training tab. You'll see the little button where you can send us a notification email that you want to be on and the Chris list. And will keep track and of we'll, all yeah, of these we'll, things for you. That, exactly. Once I know that you're interested, we will send out emails to you. So, okay, that's enough, uh, enough of the paperwork slash whatever you want to call it. Right. Housekeeping, Housekeeping. items. Yeah. Housekeeping, that's the, that's the better. So term. where Let's are we going to go on. today with the podcast itself? Well, we've actually got quite a lot of content that we want to cover in this podcast, including your ego state theory discussion, which we'll save towards the end. And this oh, will, okay. I think this is going to blow a lot of your minds for those of you out there who are doing hypnosis or interested in self-work or interested in helping others in, in any form. But let's get through some of the Q&A first because we have a few questions that came in. First one, let's address a question from Jeff. He's a recent podcast listener and he's been binge listening to all of the podcasts, which seems to happen quite frequently. A lot of people tell us they've done that. And he had some questions. One of them was that in an early podcast, you talked about how you can't make someone do something that violates their moral code using hypnosis. But what seemed to conflict with that is our discussion of how you hypnotized a waiter to accept a Toronto Public Library card as right. payment for lunch, which we talked about in prior episodes. So just to quickly recap that, it was part of a TV show. There was a film crew there. The waiter didn't know that it was about hypnosis, but you essentially used conversational hypnosis techniques on the poor fellow and had him post-hypnotically accept a library card in place of a credit card. For right. Lunch. And we have this on video. I think you right. said that you <laughs> plan to put it in the online academy for some of our students. I keep saying that. I have so much work to do, but I'll get it done eventually. But yes, we have the actual footage and it's quite hilarious. So <laughs> well, here, I'll tell you, let me tell you how we answer this, Chris, because basically this is, this is an example of what Ernst Hilgard called the hidden observer. And to preframe even that, remember that everything with hypnosis is context. As soon as you put context into the equation, what is occurring then makes sense. So in a stage show, it is a context where people are expected to behave in unusual and bizarre ways. That's why they're on stage to begin with. And even if they are skeptics as to whether or not hypnosis will actually occur, the very fact of them volunteering indicates a willingness to go along with what's happening to some degree. So there is a context made available for people to do crazy things. So now let's transfer the context to the Dominion Hotel Toronto when I got the waiter to take a, a library card as payment. Now, as you said, he did not know that we were shooting a documentary on hypnosis. He just knew that he was serving a table where we had permission to film and that he might be on camera at some times. So Right away, his guard is up, or at least his curiosity state is going to be fired. It'll be in the executive. He's wondering what's happening here. It has now created a context that is an unusual one. This is not people just sitting in a restaurant having lunch. This is people sitting in a restaurant having a conversation while they are being filmed, and he's being filmed. So does that make sense to you? Right away, we've made an unusual context. Well, absolutely, and I think that the... The hidden observer during hypnosis, which I imagine you're going to get to, is aware of the fact that you're probably not a criminal breaking the law when That's there's a it, film crew exactly there. exactly where I'm going with it. The hidden observer in Hilgard's theory, I think from 1977, is the idea that even if you hypnotize someone to get hypnotic, um, let's say, cancellation of the hearing sense, so the person will respond exactly as someone who is deaf. And I believe some studies have indicated that even if you check the brain waves, there is no spike when there's a sudden noise that indicates a startle reflex. So you've hypnotically removed 
the ability to hear. Now, here's where the problem comes in. It's one of the usual paradoxes of hypnosis. Then Hildegard uh, came up, Hildegard came up with this idea, not Hildegard, sorry. Hildegard came up with this concept that there is an observer who is present, who is not deaf, who can still hear everything going on and is acting as part of the protective mechanism to observe the situation. Do you mean like, for example, if you were in an audience and somebody suddenly shouted fire, that the hidden observer would act to protect you? Yes, that's right. And it, it's it's a part that is never in trance under those circumstances. Now, this goes deeper. If you read the Oxford studies, um, the Oxford book of hypnosis, you'll recognize that the, the problem with this is some researchers believe that this whole hidden observer is being created by searching for it. So uh -huh. when you hypnotize the person and say, was there a part of you that could still hear and was aware of everything going on? It'll say yes. But the question is, was there, or is it only answering now after the fact because it's expected that it, it's a very, very difficult thing to test. And one of my colleagues and very dear friend, Dr. Arthur Perlini at Algoma University, who's professor of psychology there, he loves doing experiments with lie detectors, with polygraphs, all of the building layer upon layer. You know, how bad was the pain out of 10? Oh, it was only a three under hypnosis. Then the polygraph shows they're lying. I mean, uh -huh. layer upon layer of stuff, but they respond like someone who does not feel the pain. So it's a difficult thing to figure out. What we can say in the case of the waiter is the hidden observer would probably recognize from the unusual context that something was happening which would legitimize him taking that library card. It is no violation of his moral code. Plus the fact that he maybe doesn't even go with any of that, but knows that it is being filmed, then shows that we're not robbing the place, as you alluded to earlier. So exactly. you still, I, Erickson was adamant that you cannot get people to violate their moral code, although some people get it backwards or get it wrong. They'll say, isn't it true that you won't do something you wouldn't normally do? No, of course not. That's not true at all. People do all kinds of things they wouldn't normally do when they're under hypnosis. They don't typically sit with their eyes shut and their hand floating in the air. But <laughs> that happens a lot with catalepsy, right? Or quacking like ducks or barking like trees or whatever it is. But when the moral code is directly challenged, I'm not saying you can't bypass it in certain ways. Some people believe that if you hypnotize some beautiful young woman and tell her she's alone, it's uh, at a cottage, she's been working in the garden, she's sweaty and hot, and she wants to take a quiet shower alone, that then she will undress because you have created a context. But then the idea of a hidden observer protecting her would prevent that from happening. So Erickson was still adamant that you're not going to do that because, remember, hypnosis is a consensual state. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. That's a good answer. So let's move on to the next question, which comes from Eric in Ohio. And I think this is a really good question. He wants to know, and I would like for you, Mike, to expand upon this a bit and educate the audience here. How can you use embedded commands in an everyday conversation, and he wants to use them in a way, in a way that's helpful for others, and not sound weird. Well, <laughs> I love so the, and not sound weird. Because, so we have to we have to talk about what embedded commands well, are and how about, they can let's talk sound. About how weird. weird they can sound. I, I, exactly. I said this before there was a, a young man who wanted to take my master hypnosis course without <laughs> having taken yeah without having taken my regular course. And I don't permit anyone to do that, no matter how good a hypnotist they are, for the simple reason that there are things that they will study in my course that they don't get anywhere else until my stuff becomes mainstream, which typically takes two years. So they're not going to get my clench induction or single fingered catalepsy or my, you know, Mandel protocol for viewing um, psychotherapeutic or hypnotherapeutic session, all of these things. So I tell them they have to do my basic course to be equipped to then do the master course. But he wasn't buying this. He was convinced he was good enough. And he trained elsewhere. And he left and you a voicemail. He left me a voicemail that sounded like this. And as you fall into a trance and begin to realize that I'm the right student for your master course, you can sit back and relax in that chair and discover that you are going deeper. It's a parody. It's so heavy handed. What we have here is this man um, modeling Tad James, who's modeling Richard Bandler, who's modeling Milton Erickson. And every generation you get further and further away from it, the more obvious and heavy handed it becomes. Now, Tad does a great job. But, and I have nothing but respect for Tad James, so hear me right. But Erickson didn't do this stuff. His embedded commands were so subtle. His anchoring with his dentures clicking and all of these things were so subtle. It took people like Jay Ingram and, um, I was going to say, um, Gilbert and Sullivan. I meant 
Van Lorn <laughs> Grinder. <laughs> and I was going to say, don't have a whiteout. That's right. Thank you. It took people like Van Lorn Grinder to deconstruct what he was doing and, and quantify it all and, and make it clear. So Erickson stuff was subtle. So when you start doing really, really strong changes in vocal tone that are very strange, it, it, it sounds heavy handed, ridiculous. Now, I want you to answer this, Chris, because we've had this discussion. And of everyone I know, you who used to be a brow furrower, yes. a, a brow furrowing embedded commander, is you're now doing a great job with this stuff. And so maybe you'd like to explain it. Well, I think that if I was Eric and looking to use embedded commands in everyday language, I would simply do it by telling stories. I would start by telling stories to people or talking about something that happened so that you're engaging curiosity in your listener. And then as you're telling the story, you can just have people become aware of how they would feel in that sort of situation. You can embed commands through absolutely normal conversation. You can touch them on the shoulder. You can make eye contact with someone that you weren't directly speaking to as you say something. And you can just change your tonality slightly as you do it. And it's really simple to do, isn't it, Mike? As you have just been doing. Yes, it is. Right. Really <laughs> simple. The key is to just back off a bit. And obviously on recordings, you have to be a bit more heavy-handed with it because you're going across the board, hitting a lot of people, and you're forced to do relaxation and things like that. But one-on-one, -on -one, um, keep it simple. <laughs> nice embedded command. Thanks again. So the other th uh, well, let's give Eric and our other listeners some suggestions then. What are some positive and helpful commands that you can slip into your everyday conversation? You can tell people that they open have your the mind. skills that they need. Yeah, open yeah. your mind. Yeah. Realize that you have the skills you need. You're getting smarter every day. Mm-hmm. So just Find figure it out ahead of simple time. positives. Yeah. Drop your voice or look at the person when you say them. Establish eye contact just as you underline that part of the communication. You can do it with no tonal shift whatsoever. Or as Chris said, touch them on the shoulder. As you say the underlined part, it will have the exact same effect. Don't right. confuse it with anchoring. It isn't, and but it's a powerful thing. I find personally doing this while not even thinking about it is a lot easier than thinking about it and doing it at the same time. Right, and because if, I, if I'm think thinking about, about it and do what it, am I going to embed here? No, I start have talking. A yeah, you just start talking instead. And and then what comes to your conscious awareness before so you actually out. deliver it is not a whiteout. It's the fact that, oh, okay, I'm going to just mark out this particular statement right here and then just keep talking. What were you saying? Out. What were you just saying? Know. I have no idea. I had a whiteout, Mike. No. <laughs> no. All right. Let's, uh, if you don't know the whiteout joke that came a few podcasts earlier, can't remember the history of it because I just had a whiteout. Whiteouts are hilarious. They are. That's, that's Unless one Unless they of happen favorite. to you in front of thousands of people. Right. All right. Let's move back to next question. Jeff asked us if handwriting analysis, that is, graphology, is based on actual data because based on him listening to the podcast, some of the stuff you were describing sounds so unbelievable. He yes. wants to know, is this stuff real? Is this based on science or uh, quantifiable data of some sort? It absolutely is. Uh, you can get degrees in graphology, I believe, from the Sorbonne in Paris and University of Heidelberg. In Europe, it is mainstream. It's used in maybe 70 to 80% of hirings and firings and pairing people to jobs. How did they do this? The same way you do any science. You create a model and see if you can make a prediction based on that model and then check the results. In this case, they would, they would look at thousands and thousands of samples of handwriting, as Andrea McNichol so well pointed out, who's a graphologist who worked with Scotland Yard, the FBI, and so on. Thousands of samples of alcoholics. What shows up continuously in alcoholics' handwriting? Thousands of samples of people who are clinically depressed. Thousands of samples of people with criminality. And then they began to determine which elements were consistent in the form uh, of the handwriting itself, which were indicative of the personality. And over time, because it's no longer a new science, I mean, like optics, it's been around for a very long time, hundreds of years, they were able to, they were able to discover which things were repeated in handwriting, which could be used as a predictive element. So if I see the literary D, I know the person has writing ability, whether or not they're using it. If I see very high T bars that are long and heavy weight, I know this person reaches for the sky with their goals. And that's a funny one, Chris, because I had, um, I do a lot of forensic keynotes with forensic graphology, as you know, and also uh, forensic hypnosis, speaking in the university circuit, Cambrian College, St. Clair College, different colleges and universities around Canada so far. And the results have been amazing because I've never had one kid say to me, you're wrong. If anything, they're always, sh they're shocked when I talk yeah. to them. And one guy who uh, I believe he had cerebral palsy 
Uh, he was quite disabled, but was a student there. He showed me his handwriting. And the number one trait, I, the first thing I do is I look for an overview. What's the first thing that jumps out at me? And the T bars were really, really high, and the small letter T were very long and heavy and were pointed upwards. So that shows me someone with high goals, optimism, enthusiasm, someone who's reaching for the freaking sky with his goals. Now, I'm looking at this guy in front of me, and if I was to say logically that that would be true, I, I wouldn't even have said it to him because it wouldn't make any sense looking at him that that would be the case. But it turns out that this guy ran for school president, even with a cerebral palsy. He didn't get elected, Fantastic. but he worked behind the scenes. He got on the committee. He just pushes and pushes and is always extending himself past what is considered possible for him. And it showed up in his handwriting. So in answer to his question, the, the short answer is, yes, it's based on large samples and making predictions based on those samples, scientific model as always. And like any other science, then you can make predictions based on the model. Awesome. That's fantastic. Okay, let's go to the next one, which is probably the last question we'll, we'll be able to do. And then we've got to talk about this ego state integration protocol that you have. So next question is also from Jeff. Is it possible to become a hypnotherapist without a psychology degree? This is a really good question. That's a great degree. I know great, you want to talk question. about this. Yeah, yeah. Great question. It's um, not only possible, it's the most likely case. There are movements worldwide to attempt to restrict hypnotists and restrict hypnotherapy so that only doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists can practice it, which is ludicrous because most doctors, psychologists, and psychiatrists are not trained in hypnosis. It's right. like saying only dentists can practice it. Well, dentists aren't typically trained in hypnosis. So the people I believe who should be doing hypnosis are hypnotists. So regardless yeah. of whether you're an auto <laughs> you have a degree in auto mechanics or you know, psychology or whatever, maybe a degree in psychology will help you put some sort of context or packaging around what you're doing. You'll be able to treat more serious things or whatever. And again, I'm in no way saying take a weekend long course and then go and attempt to treat schizophrenics. Nothing like that. But I am saying that the best people to do hypnosis are hypnotists because that's well, what we do. It does make sense. I mean, as brilliant of a psychologist as you can be, if you just take a two-day course or something and then start practicing without any experience doing it, you're not going to be very good, right? And the right. fact that you have a psychology degree really is no more relevant to, um, to the situation as, say, a bricklayer who installs your furnace. Right. <laughs> I mean, much, they're, both yeah. related, they're both related to home construction, say. Right. So what, right? I mean, bricklayers, as far as I know, don't study heating, ventilation, okay. and air conditioning. Right, right. I'm glad you clarified that because I was going to say, who the heck put your furnace in a bricklayer? That's it's totally yeah. weird. Bricklayers put up wallpaper. That's it. So where are we, go where are we going with this, Chris? <laughs> okay, so that's the question. Um, well, let's talk about the title. Hit I, we've talked back about this it up. before. Hang on, sorry to interrupt you. Let's back it up here. Sure, uh, sure, sure. Some yeah. of the best hypnotists in the direct um, paradigm. So Milton Erickson was a psychiatrist. Let's take nothing away from Milton. As you know, I'm a huge Erickson fan. So which meant being a psychiatrist, he was also an MD. But yeah, and we're not people... we're not saying that having another degree outside of the no. field of hypnosis is a bad thing. Absolutely it's not, not. I mean, absolutely look, not. We have students who are medical doctors. You know, an anesthesiologist in Australia, Michael in Australia, uh, Matthias in Boston is an MD. Uh, Gary Petoshenko in uh, California, Los Angeles is an MD and a pain management specialist. So we have doctors who are training with us to do these things. But a lot of great hypnotists like Dave Elman, Gil Boyne, Charles Tebbets. These were people who had learned a powerful set of skills and had learned to help people and set them free from all sorts of problems, apart from the fact that they were not psychologists or psychiatrists. Yeah. Did you say Dave, Dave Elman there? I think you did. Dave Elman, absolutely. Yeah, of yeah. course. So perfect example. So bottom line is anyone can become a hypnotist. Not everyone should use the label hypnotherapist. That, and, that's and becoming no one more should of a, work beyond their abilities. And absolutely. Get some good training. But doesn't matter what your background is, computer programmer, car mechanic, newspaper delivery boy, cable guy, yeah. doctor, dentist, lawyer, Okay, Chris, anything. I think you've named about 400 <laughs> different jobs. You're turning into a Ken Sweatman story. All right, thanks. <laughs> yeah. so, Orthodontist, so I think denturist, that makes perfect sense. optometrist. Now, the, 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 other, <laughs> the other thing here to mention, Mike, of course, is that hypnosis, what we're finding from the academy, our online students, is probably about a 50-50 mix of people who are genuinely interested in learning hypnosis to do hypnosis and those who are just so curious because it's so related. It is so related to every aspect of communication in your life. 
Well, yeah, I mean, we, I'm going to be on another podcast, a, a different one. As you know, they're recording it next week. I've been asked to go on this one from Europe. And um, one of the questions is, like, what is my definition of hypnosis? Well, it really depends. I, is that Adams? Yes, that's right. Okay. And I'm, I'm back to thinking, Chris, that hypnosis is an extremely effective form of communication and an amplifier of human experience. And if we think of it in those terms, I think we're probably pretty safe with putting a good label on it that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. Do you want to move into ego state theory and the Mandela ego state integration protocol? I think this is going to require a good 10 minutes. Okay. Um, Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll make this podcast a tiny bit longer than normal. Just so people can sort of see where we're going. Those of you who are therapists, hypnotherapists or psychotherapists will probably find this interesting because I've created a new protocol and I'm not just putting it out there and making the protocol available, but I will tell you about it. Um, it's a very specific system that has to be run. I spent a lot of time studying ego state theory and going back to the work of um, Federn, who was a compatriot of Freud, then to Watkins and Watkins, and then Gordon Emerson out of Australia. A lot of key people have written extensively and lectured extensively on this idea that our personality is made of parts. And where is with someone who is MPD or um, DID, dissociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder, whatever you want to call it, those parts often aren't aware of each other. They don't have good communication lines with each other. But the rest of us have about 5 to 15 personality parts that we use on a daily basis, although we may actually have hundreds of them. And there is a thing called the executive, which is, which is basically conscious awareness. And these parts are not imaginary. They're part of the physical structure of the brain through axon growth and dendrite growth, growth and uh, running these patterns over and over and over, ingrain them in the brain. So they're part of the physical structure of the brain and they're digital. So when you're running one of these personality parts, it's the one that is in the executive at that time. And so it's the one that is conscious. So if you, I say to you, point to yourself. And when you do, you're pointing to the ego state that is currently in the executive, that is currently conscious. Now, having said that, some of them will be aware in the background of what you're doing at the time. They'll be aware of what you're saying to other states. Other states will be totally unconscious at any given moment. And it is vitally important as a model because what this shows is things like, say you're doing EFT or faster EFT or be set free fast or one of these things. We always make sure the person is feeling the negative emotions when we run the tapping regimen. Otherwise, we will run into those times when you tap yourself to death, you almost bruise yourself and the problem isn't going away. Well, ego state theory explains this. See, what's happening is the state that is in the executive is not the vaded or damaged state. It's an intellectual state. Well, you know, if I see snakes, I get upset. Now, you know, if I go golfing, but it's not the one that's damaged. You've got to get the snake state into the executive by saying, <laughs> tell me an actual time it happened when you freaked out. I mean, this kind of thing. Okay, let me ask you for a clarification point here, because for people who are hearing this for the first time, ego state, an ego state, what you would, let's say you were going to label that state that's afraid of snakes, what would you call it? Just so we can give it a label and well, understand can, what the different uh, states call are. It the and sna call it the snake fear state. The snake fear yeah, state. Okay. Whatever it is. As opposed to, say, the confident public speaker state. Sure, or the... and that's one of the problems. You know, people can be confident with their family talking, they're relaxed and comfortable. Then they're in front of an audience and they're not comfortable. They're frightened or terrified, whatever, because they have the wrong state in the executive at that time to handle the situation. Okay, so, so the, there, when there being, isn't... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead, Chris. Okay, there isn't some list of states that no. exist. It's really context specific and each person is going to come up with their own Absolutely. idea of which states exist for them. And some of them will some of them will be childlike and innocent and that's not the one you want on the surface if you're giving mm -hmm. a presentation to a group of bikers. <laughs> you you want the yeah. right one for the situation. And like I, one of the things I've taught people to do is have an assertive state in the executive instead of an aggressive one. An aggressive one will ramp things up too much. But you keep the aggressive one so that if you're attacked by a pack of dogs or some psycho in an alleyway, the aggressive one through the instigation of the assertive one now takes the executive instantly. And that's the one that'll save your life. That's the one you want there. So right. part of this is all about getting the right state in the executive at the right time, making sure they're not conflicted with each other. Because when you say something like, or when one says, you know, oh, I hate it when I do that. I wish I could quit drinking. Whatever it is, you're hearing a conflict between two or more ego states. One wants to keep drinking for some reason. 
One wants to stop it because of health reasons. So it's all different. You have an ego state that tells you when you're tired. One that, t- that monitors when you should eat. They do all of these different things. That's so like, essentially, anytime you say that you want to do something, but you behave in a different way, right? A you, have an ego state con- you have an ego state conflict. Conflict, right. So the conflict has to be negotiated. Now, the pattern I've come up with that we taught at the last architecture of hypnosis course just to the masters and people like Nico from Strasbourg, France and Ron Grebler in Toronto and Pap. I mean, all these people studied it and got amazing results with it is the basic idea, Chris, is Emerson points out and others point out that everyone seems to have one overriding ego state that is the most spiritual, the, the wisest, most empowering state of all. That's entire purpose is to help this person have some purpose and live a good life. The good thing about that state is all the other ego states will listen to it. It's got this authority, which is interesting. So the protocol I've come up with and developed, and we're going to be getting out there more and more, is using hypnosis to access this overriding wisdom state and then having it design a committee according to a specific paradigm that seeks out vaded, injured ego states, helps them heal, finds ego states that are in conflict, gets them getting along with each other, finds ego states that are taking the executive when they shouldn't, giving them different tasks, and doing this all below the threshold of conscious awareness, and the person's life just starts getting better in leaps and bounds, and it's mind-blowing. So that sounds really cool. So the idea here is you're finding like the alpha state. The, the, I'm thinking when I say alpha, I mean like an alpha male in a pack of I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah. Even that's a bit strong. Um, it's more a wisdom state, and it's one the others will listen to because ego states all love being in the executive, and they all love to be appreciated. And when they are nurtured and loved and talked to by the other states, even at an unconscious level, we can bring them back into the fold. And then once this program is set up hypnotically, it's a simple matter of going back into trance yourself and checking in with them. And over time, They're finding and integrating more and more of these states, and it's astounding what happens. I worked with Lisa on this program, one of our master hypnotists who's a scientist, engineer like Chris, and she was at the pub with us all afterwards at the last night of the training, and she suddenly had to leave. And she told me the next day she could feel something happening under the surface and just wanted to get away from people. And she said she realizes now that a lot of this integration was happening beneath the surface as the states were being brought back into the fold. Interesting. And as we become integrated, all of us, which is incumbent upon us to do, these states will begin to be healed and conflicts will break and we'll get the right states in the executive when we need them. And that is integration. All right. So how do people learn more about this, Mike? Have we even come and study with us in Toronto? We're going to figure out how to do this. (laughs) All right. We get so many products that are coming out, so many trainings. We want to get Mindscaping as an online training or as a purchasable training. We got people in the Netherlands asking how they can study it all around the world. These are things that will change people's lives. And my aim, and I know it's yours too, Chris, is it's not just a business. It's a calling with us. We like people to have better lives. So let me give you the empowering question for today's podcast. Go for it. My empowering question for all of you listening, and some of you specifically, is what are you going to do in 2015 that will absolutely improve the quality of your life? What are you going to do in 2015 that will absolutely improve the quality of your life? That is a darn good question. Let's put some serious thought to it. So for those of you listening, before we do our closing metaphor, I want to remind you to visit MikeMandelHypnosis.com. You will find that you can join our mailing list, get a free copy of the Brain Software ebook, which is fantastic. And of course, we just finished filming and posting for availability the video version of that, which will be made available to people I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to do that yet, but that will be made available to you. So Mike Mandel, hypnosis.com, get on our mailing list, check out the courses, send us a notification if you want to be on a waiting list, and make sure you go to iTunes as well and leave a rating and a review for this podcast so we can get the message out to the global world. Redundancy, <laughs> redundancy. Nice redundancy. <laughs> I love it. Eh? Beautiful. All right, closing metaphor time. Here's the metaphor for, for today, Chris. It's not a long one. But it's a deep one, and it basically is one of the most formative parts of my life. I think you've heard it before. Many years ago, when I was a kid, we used to go camping virtually every weekend. My parents were camping junkies, 
and they had one of those small Coleman stoves. And the story is, even when we were in England, when I'm too young to remember, I was too young to remember, my sister was quite young at the time, my parents would take forever to make a 30, 40 mile journey in the car. A, because the car would be breaking down constantly, and B, because when the car wasn't breaking down, they would celebrate by pulling over and making tea on this Coleman stove. Remember I said, I saw my dad sitting with a slide rule at a table with charts he'd made, and he was actually logging the date he thought he would drink his one millionth cup of tea. I mean, hilarious guy. So he called the slide rule a guessing stick. He said, I can't be sure of the date, but this is going to be pretty close. Well, anyway, my parents were true English eccentrics, Chris. There's no, no doubt about it. So they would go camping on the weekends, even when it was pouring rain. Now, you know, I'm a rain fanatic, so I didn't mind that so much. But setting up a tent in the rain, a big, heavy canvas tent is less than pleasant experience. Nine by 12, soaking wet, clinging around your head. And then the Coleman stove set up and the tea. Well, anyway, we were camping at the Sandbanks Park. And I must have been about 12. And this was a formative moment in my life because a lot of people's tents had been burglarized over the weekend. In fact, people's coolers were stolen. And it was obviously kids just looking for beer, dumping stuff out, slitting bags of milk and so on, and cartons of milk, just dumping people's food out for something to do. We never saw anyone. But in the night, one night, I suddenly woke up because my dad thought someone was unzipping our tent to get in. And it was me and my mother and I on sleeping bags, on air mattresses, camp cots. And my dad heard someone, he thought, I'm sure he imagined it, unzipping the tent to get in. And here's my father, my protector. And what did he do? He sat up in bed, terrified, and just yelled, it's okay, I got him. And just sat there shaking in the dark. And I remember at that moment thinking, Chris, my God, he cannot protect us. And at age 12, I determined that I was going to be the protector of the family. And that began to inexorably direct me into becoming an Enneagram type eight. That's an awesome story, Mike. All right. So that is the end of the podcast. We will continue putting these out. Oh, regularly. These, we have so much more material to discuss, Mike. So I won't repeat the ending that I already gave before the metaphor. So we'll see you on the next podcast, everybody. Thanks and good again. night. Good night. Um, Christopher, Mr. Thompson, have, have I ever told you the story of Squatter's brother after the event with the bagmen of Edward the Confessor and the horrible things that happened and how he was so naive that Bryce Morgan took him under his wing and saw an immediate new target. Did I, did I tell you the story of no. the presentation to Lord Melbury? No, do tell. Well, after we got him in the regiment, he was quite comfortable being there. We all went to an event where Lord Melbury sat on a raised chair, sort of a dais at the end of the room, and there was all the regimental colors and flags. And we told him that he was supposed to go as the newest member of the Fusiliers, up to Lord Melbury, he was to bow and greet him a very specific way. Now, Bryce Morgan said, make sure when you see him, go up to Lord Melbury and say, I'm grateful to be here, Lord Melbury, and I greet you in the name of William Fitzgerald, Fitzgeoffrey, Fitzsimmons, Fitzsnowden, Fitztomas, Fitzreggie, Fitzpurple Umbrella Stand. And Squatter said, what? He said, you must greet him in the name of William Fitzgerald, Fitzgeoffrey, Fitzsimmons, Fitzsnowden, Fitztomas, Fitzreggie, Fitzpurple Umbrella Stand. And Squatter said, I, I'm not sure if I can remember it. He said, here, this will help. And he gave him about half a pint of scotch to drink. <laughs> Squatter downed it. And about eight minutes later, they said, it's your turn. Get up there. Get up there. Of course, Bryce Morgan was making the whole thing up, which was the entire point. Squatter staggers up to the chair, kneels down on one knee, and he says, Lord Melbury, uh, Willie Fitz-Snowden. And Melbury says, what? What are you muttering about, man? He said, Willie Umbrella Fitz. I don't know what you're talking about. And Squatter tries again. He says, Willie Fitz Roger Umbrella Stan Fitz Rectum. Oh, bollocks. And he was arrested for profanity in front of his lordship and fined 200 pounds. <laughs> Just the funniest damn thing. He fit right in after that. <laughs> Oh.